Well, you've probably never seen Conner Prairie in the winter, but we're going there in the off season today to see who takes care of the chickens and the other animals on Indiana Outdoors. Welcome to Indiana Outdoors. I'm Jill Dittmeyer. And I'm Don Van Meter. We're in Hamilton County at Connor Prairie, and we're near an area called Liberty Corner. Mm -hmm. That's right. From April to October, Connor Prairie is open, and they have five historical areas that you could experience outside. We're in Liberty Corner right now. That means they're taking us back to 1886. It's a long time ago. Yes, it is. Well, a little later in the show, we're going to talk to a person who takes care of the livestock, mm -hmm. and there's lots of livestock here yes, at Conner Prairie. But first, we're going to look at a different kind of livestock. We're going to Delaware County near Albany and find some alpacas. Oh, and believe it or not, they're even cuter than these guys. no such thing as typical when you live on a farm. Every day is unique. Uh, so it's always a new day. It's always exciting to see what's going to happen. Uh, my name's Shannon McConnell. Uh, I'm the owner of the Shepherd's Oak Alpaca Farm in Albany, Indiana. Wanted to do something with the farm and I encountered the alpacas and did about two years worth of research before I invested in my first two alpacas. And that was in 98 and now the farm is about 75 alpacas. I can easily take care of my herd of 75, 80 animals. If it was 75, 80 cattle, horses, I wouldn't be able to do it alone. Uh, so they're very easy, easy to care for animal, and gentle, and very entertaining. <laughs> An alpaca is a member of the camel family. The alpaca is around 150 pounds when it's fully grown. They were domesticated by the early Incas for fiber production. A lot of people are allergic to sheep's wool because of the lanolin. Alpaca fiber, unlike sheep's fiber, sheep's wool is kind of scratchy. Uh, the scale structure in the individual hair is a little bit different. It's fun when a, a parent comes along or a teacher comes along and says, uh, here's some llamas to the kids and we have to correct the poor teacher <laughs> whose face usually turns beet red when we say they're not a llama. And uh, it's an opportunity to share that with uh, not only the kids, but the adults. We have preschool groups that come out, school groups that come out. Usually when the visitors come, we'll get out the Cheerios or the chopped carrots, and those are the treats for the alpacas. So the alpacas love to have visitors because that's when they get their Cheerios. The alpacas each have their own personality. Uh, I can tell all 75, 80 animals on the farm because they all act slightly different. Just like people, there's some that are pleasant and sweet and others that are just grumpy and mean but for the most part, the animals on this farm are pretty friendly. Come by and see us at the Shipshawan Alpaca Store in Shipshawan, Indiana. We're located in the Davis Mercantile. If you're interested in alpaca, we have all the information here, uh, a good assortment of goods and uh, clothing, household items that uh, you may be interested in. And we do love it. It's, it is that rural lifestyle that appealed to us and now we're living proof of it. Um, alpaca fiber is uh, considered luxury fiber. It's very much like cashmere, uh, very soft, very fine, very strong, and very warm. The animals are only chorn once a year, so they only produce maybe five to 10 pounds a year. So um, besides being wonderful luxury, but it's also very rare too. We shear in the spring. Um, their animals will probably have anywhere from four to six inches of fiber on them at the at the time. The shearing process with a lot, of, if you have a lot of animals on the farm, usually hire a shearer to come to the farm and shear the animals. We do an unusual thing with shearing them. We don't shear them like sheep. We actually stretch them out, tie off their legs, and shear one side, flip them over, shear the other side, and get them off. And um, it's to keep them safe and us safe. Um, if they do struggle, they can either hurt themselves or hurt some of the handlers. We usually have five people on helping and calming the alpaca, and 15 minutes later they have a new do and they can go romping and stomping out. The 
prime fiber um, is the blanket. From the blanket, um, you can probably get maybe five sweaters out of the blanket, depending on the pattern that's being used. If you're making socks out of the blanket, you know, probably 12 dozen socks. What I'm doing is spinning on a spinning wheel. It's a kind of a modern looking spinning wheel, but it's based on the ancient design. And all the wheel is doing is twisting the yarn. And therefore, with a twist in it, it makes it a lot stronger. And it's kind of fun and relaxing for people who do like to spin. We like the product end of it so well that we decided that we would go into the, the clothing line first. Clothing, gifts, bears. The sweaters and the coats. There's something here for everyone. It's just, it's fun. It's fun. <laughs> I'm here with Kevin Miller, the livestock manager here at Contra Prairie, and they have lots of livestock. What kind of livestock do you have, Kevin, here? This morning farm? there's about 92 head here. We've 92. Got horses, cattle, sheep, hogs, turkeys, chickens, and goats. So we have seven species here that I'm responsible for. I have a, a crew of ag staff, there's four of us, that take care of the stock year-round. Now, why did you pick the particular livestock that you have here? Well, most of the livestock we have here has to be historically accurate for the first part. We enjoy the rare breeds. We enjoy telling the story of the rare breeds, like these lineback cattle that we're leaning on are the rarest breed of cattle in the United States. They have a history that goes back to the pilgrims, and, and we, can, we can share that with the youth. How, how about, you mentioned yes. rare breeds. That's mm -hmm. something that I think many of our viewers are not too familiar with. We think a cow is a cow or a sheep is a sheep, but that's not necessarily the case. Right, there's a lot of variation in the breeds and these have been developed by stockmen for centuries and just because what's popular today doesn't mean the others have to go extinct because they're second best or third best in their particular categories. So, so really, if there weren't facilities like you have here at Connor Prairie, it's possible that some of these rare breeds might become extinct. Well, many of them have gone extinct this, this century. Uh, this breed got with it in 1985. There was only 20 head of this breed of cattle left, and luckily they were saved for conservation efforts, so now we can show them off. Uh, they're a very intelligent breed. They're easy to train, very docile, very easy for the folks to be around, and very trustworthy. So. It would have been a shame to lose this breed forever. Extinction's so, forever, whether it's in whales or tigers or breeds of livestock. And why might we might not want a breed to become extinct? We don't know what we're gonna do in the future. So if we keep that genetic resource available, we can come back and tap into it at a later time. If, for example, we decide omega-3 fatty acids actually cure cancer, then we'll need animals that can perform on grass only because that is a source of, of omega-3s. For another example, our Osceola Island hogs have survived for four or 500 years without human help, yet they've survived diabetes. So yes. Purdue actually has a research herd of the Osceola Island hogs, and uh, they are doing diabetic research on it. So that breeds within 150 of being extinct, and they may hold the key. Well, certainly when the visitors come in the summer, mm -hmm. they enjoy seeing the livestock. Sure. Do you allow them to get up this close to like old Blue here and well, pet her? We sure Petty? try to. We want to have them, uh, all our animals need to be 100% trustworthy. Uh, we have special programs where they can come out and we'll have them uh, hold baby lambs in the yeah. spring. We'll have uh, the horses out in harness where we can, of course they all have to be supervised for the safety of both the animal and the guest. But uh, most of our animals have to be available for, for people to be trustworthy around. So I suspect that that's part of the reason you and your crew have jobs in the wintertime. Sure. Um, we have to keep them in condition like any athlete would for the summer. If we're going to be plowing in the spring, we need these horses to be ready to work. So we will harness them up and work them during the winter. Uh, red and blue here are just yearlings right now. So they're, they're going through their whole training regime. Uh, we're teaching them to work in yoke. We're teaching them their commands. Uh, we're teaching them to work and, and pull things. And hopefully by spring we'll have them in tone and in condition to work yeah. with our big team. We'll have four steers working in one team on a plow, we hope. What do uh, visitors like to see best of all? Oh, all the animals have their own cheering group. You know, the horses obviously have a lot of people that love horses. Even sheep have their people. The hogs even have a few people Is that, that like them. So we have them all. The different guests have their favorites. Uh, when baby animals come, it's a it's a treat for all the guests. Doesn't make There's no ugly baby animals. No ugly baby animals. Uh, why don't we put a, uh, a yoke on these steers sure. and uh, and see if we can get them to drive? I th think we can. Okay. It'll take just a second here, but uh, this yoke was actually made here on site. Uh, it's a replica, obviously, but uh, one of our tradesmen had this in his antique collection. It's an 1840s yoke. They copied it here exactly, and uh, we use it to work red and blue. So, do they enjoy being worked? 
they uh, really do. If you would hold the shim and I'll the pin hold it for here. me here. I got this is the other one. Hit up. Okay. First off, we hit up, Luke. We turn this over. This was a straight piece of elm at one time. Come up. There we go. Hit up, Luke. We also teach them the commands. We pull the bow in. We put a shim over the top. Then the pin. Red's good to go. We do the same on the other side with blue. Blue, step over. You hold these and I'll try it. There you go. We spin that around. And you see it's offset a little bit. The longer edge goes on first. That's easy to line it up. And then we put a little pressure on this outside. It should line up with both, both of the holes. I, I, you can tell that uh, you have a little more experience doing this than I do. And the, the guests enjoy doing this. These are one of the, some of the kind of things we can do. If you'll switch that around, the longer one will, can go in the middle a little easier. Turn them around? Mm -hmm. Like this. There you go. I got you. There we go. And it's usually easier when they're not uh, trying to eat hay. On a, on, that's an extra added uh, now, do difficulty you, do point. Do you grow here. any of the feed here for the We for do the have a working stock? farm here. So we have uh, our, our uh, yep. replica equipment that we use. We, we grow corn, wheat, oats, hay. Uh, and we do harvest it in, in costume, in character. Uh, and we will uh, put light, uh, well, like loose hay up here in the hay yes. mile. We'll have uh, ear corn that we'll use, uh, oats that we'll use. So yeah, we do have a working farm here. Well, let's get them out of oh, here boys. and we'll see how they drive. Boys, now we'll slip. Get up, get up. You know, Don, you sure do a good job at these Pioneer farm chores. No yoke about it. <laughs> you know, Pioneer life was, uh, it was hard work indeed. And the subject of our next story is a pioneer himself and definitely a futurist. Yes, Vic Cook from Pendleton is a music teacher and a, a visionary. And almost single-handedly, he's built a house that's half underground and totally powered by the sun. It's called The Giant because it's huge, 7,000 square feet, and it's down under the ground so you barely even know it's there. Well, and in this house, he has a, a modern uh, recording studio, he has video equipment, he has computers, and, and all of it, again, supported by the sun as far as electrical energy goes. It's truly an example of modern technology and nature. Mm -hmm. In front of my uh, home known as The Giant in Pendleton, Indiana. Uh, I've got a uh, video editing suite, right there. a home theater system. Right there. I purify my own water. I have a, a workshop, two or three art, different art studios, and uh, a special place up in the very top of the house for writing, a loft, a writing loft, I call it. Way up in the, in the very top and it runs entirely off the sun. Uh, the way this, the solar thing works is um, the solar panel picks up the light from the sun and changes it to uh, 12 volt DC electricity, kind of like what your car runs off of. And then I have devices that in turn change that 12 volt DC into regular house current like you have in your house. When people come here and they read about me and hear about me, I, I want them to know that uh, you can now live a pioneer lifestyle and still have a, a high-tech life and be a force in life. I, I really kind of thought when I moved here that I'd have to give up 10% of the comforts for 90% of the bills. And it's, it's really gone better than that. I've only had to give up 5% of the comfort and convenience for 95% of the bills. The longest wall is 285 feet long. And it's, um, there's a lot of, when you go through the house, there's a lot of it you don't see because a lot of it is buffer between the earth and the house. In, in, in my estimation, a lot of people make an error. When they build in the ground, they, they make the house exactly as big as the hole. And I decided I want to make the hole real big and set the house in the middle of it up off of it. 
And so, man, that's made it possible for the thing to, to be as dry as it is for 25 years. It's been in the ground 25 years. Remarkable. See, this is one of the great things about outdoor Indiana, is we have some of the best hardwood to build with of, of any place in the world. And the wood I'm using mostly, almost everything that went in the, in the ground as the main supports of the house was elm. Man, it, it lasts forever in the woods. I think this is a message about taking life a little more seriously, and obviously an environmental message, and how important it is to give up a little bit of the opulence in America, particularly um, um, as the way we design our homes, we build them out in fields, and in the summer we have to spend an enormous amount of money to cool them, and in the winter uh, there are no wind breaks, and they're up on a hill, and they're, it takes more to heat them. This thing here was designed to show that if you use some, some common sense, you can get your heat from the ground a lot, and if you can't get it from the ground, you can come out here in the forest and pick it up. Vic has spent thousands of hours over many years building his home. He's a poet, he's a builder, he's an environmentalist, he's a musician, he's truly a renaissance man. Yeah, he's a, a modern day Thoreau, self-sufficient, no utility bills, yeah. whew, that would be nice. <laughs> now, remember we told you that he named his house The Giant, and it's mm -hmm. not just because it's really big, there's another reason, do you know why? Think about it, and coming up later in the show, we'll have the answer. You can visit the home by reservations only, May through October. Email Earthship Corporation at earthshipc at aol.com or write to Earthship Corporation, Post Office Box 63, Pendleton, Indiana, 46064. You know, Don, about the same time that Farmer Zimmerman was feeding his chickens here in Liberty mm -hmm. Corner, there was a piano factory in Richmond over in Wayne County that was introducing a brand new type of American music. In Whitewater Gorge, you can see the remnants of the old Star <laughs> Piano Company. And that later became Jeanette Records, and that brought in jazz. Ah. started on this site in Richmond in the 1870s. It was a very small company at that point. They employed just a handful of German craftsmen that were skilled at making pianos. As the company grew, the name changed several times. It started out as the Tracer Piano Company. Then it became the Chase Piano Company. After that, it was James Starr and Company. Finally, in 1893, they reorganized to become the Starr Piano Company. At this point in the company's history, there were two brothers, James and Benjamin Starr, who ran the company pretty much. And in the 1890s, a man by the name of Henry Jeanette became involved in the company ownership. Shortly after that, James and Benjamin Starr left the company and Henry Jeanette took over with the help of his three sons. Now in 1915, the Starr Piano Company began to make phonographs and phonograph records. Shortly after they started manufacturing phonographs, they changed the name of the record label from Star to Jeanette in honor of the Jeanette family. Now at this point in American history, many different styles of uniquely American music were forming and becoming commercialized. Jeanette was right there to record it all. The Jeanette family was not afraid to take risks. They would record black artists, Hispanic artists, Mexican artists, you name it, they would record it if they thought it would sell. As a result, they captured some of the
The Star Jeanette Foundation is a not-for-profit organization that exists here in Richmond to promote and preserve the history of Jeanette Records and its parent company, the Star Piano Company. We accomplish a, a variety of projects and have a number of goals as an organization so that we can permanently recognize the important place that Richmond has in American popular music history. The Star Jeanette Foundation has many plans for the future. Our biggest plan is to establish a permanent home for our collection and a place where people can come here at the site to learn about the history of Jeanette Records and the Star Piano Company. We'd like to reconstruct the original recording studio on the very site where it stood many years ago. Other places visitors can go in Richmond include the Wayne County Historical Museum. They have a great Jeanette exhibit and they're located on US 40. Another place where visitors can go is the Star Jeanette Foundation's exhibit located at the Louis F. Dow Studio Building right next to Charlie's Coffee Bar and Gallery. Also, the Jeanette Family Mansion still stands on East Main Street. There are many places still in Richmond where people can come and learn about the history and enjoy the outdoors at the same time. Most obviously is this, the site of the Star Piano Company. You can stand on the location of the recording studio where Louis Armstrong made his first recordings, where Charlie Patton, the recognized grandfather of the blues, made his first recordings. You can look at the parrot logo that says Jeanette Records and remember the history that once existed in Richmond. Who knew the likes of Louis Armstrong, Hoagie Carmichael, Jelly Roll Morton, they all got their start right here in Indiana. And if you'd like to belong to the Star Jeanette Foundation, go to www.starjeanette.org. Now, the folks that lived here in Liberty Corner, they grew most of their food, but over at the Lenape camp, they had to get their meat the hard way, Don, hunting. And speaking of hunting, we our next story is about hunting for muskies. Now that may seem strange, hunting for muskies, because muskie is a fish. Hmm. Now on Lake Webster, typically, if you can catch one fish, you, you feel like you should be able to catch two or three. My name's Kenton Smith. I'm currently the regional vice president for the Hoosier Muskie Hunt. We're fishing for uh, muskellunge, which uh, is the top predator in the freshwater food chain. We call it hunting because uh, really it's not so much going out and, and fishing a certain area and, and assuming there's fish there. We spend a lot of time breaking down the the data and where they should be and talking to the other fishermen and you're hunting for them. You're looking for where those fish are so you can put yourself in the optimum situation to find one. Mike Ice was with us today on this outing. Um, every month the club tries to put together an outing for its members. Um, we're a little disadvantaged because we're 100 miles away so we, we try to come up with some reasons that people would want to come up and fish as a group rather than coming up and fishing on their own. I'd say an average size muskie is 37 to 39 inches. The biggest that I've heard of caught out of here was around the 51 inch. Oh. One thing that's been astounding is that they estimate, uh, current estimates that there are between six and seven adult muskellunge, which, or muskies, which is about a 30 inch fish um, per acre on this lake, which is an outstanding number. Other, other states, um, Wisconsin, for instance, may have an outstanding lake at 1.5 or two fish per acre. Every cast, when you're, when you're fishing for these fish, you want to be prepared mentally because things happen very quickly. And it usually happens when you least expect it. Right now, it seems like most of the fish activity is next to the boat. So musky anglers will use what a technique called a figure eight. And basically what it is is trying to keep the bait moving fast and doing turns and, and increasing the speed, it seems to be the trigger to, uh, to hook in these fish. Uh, typically, uh, 
I'll, I'll probably catch a fish on every third outing that I'm out here on this lake. It's, it's not the fish you want to fish for if you're interested in catching big numbers. If you, if you want to walk away with a string or a fish, you know, if a six or eight or ten fish day is what you're nice. counting on, musculinch probably isn't a fish for you to chase. Um, the, the fabled story is it's a fish of 10,000 casts. The weight and the draw, the anticipation, I think, is what really makes the fishing outstanding when you get one. I mean, that one fish can carry you over. I mean, I talked about the, the big fish I caught in August. I mean, I've been looking at the pictures of that fish for a long time, and I will through the whole winter. And, it, you know, it, the excitement that it generated is enough to get me to come back. Because of their... Uh, predatory instincts as the top of the food chain makes them you know really finicky and able to do whatever they want when they want when they're ready to eat they will eat so you need to be in your boat with the lure in the water when that happens two years ago a friend of mine and I were up here did you see one yep there it is right there oh I got him nice Nice job. Oh. You're awesome, Kathy. Awesome, baby. Awesome. Who's your muskies? Let's get a measurement of her and back in the water real quick. 41. There she goes. Excellent. I gotta get my composure back. Oh, you caught three fish in the morning is an outstanding catch. It doesn't matter what state you're in, what country you're in, to catch three muskellunge in a four hour fishing session is just outstanding. That, that tops the charts. Three musky in one day. I've never had that much luck fishing before, Don. I, I haven't either, and that's an exceptionally good musky hunting day. Yeah. They, they, they release these fish, they don't keep them, they just hunt them for fun. Uh, like the fun we've had yes. here today at Liberty Corner, here at Connor Prairie's uh, Living Museum. Now, we promised you the answer to that quiz question, too. Do you know why Vic Cook named his house the giant, other than the obvious reason? Hmm. He named it the giant because he felt it was a giant environmental step for mankind, kind of like astronaut Neil Armstrong yes. when he walked on the moon in 1969. That one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Well, that's our show for today. We hope you've enjoyed it. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. We're going to go leap over here and find some oxen. I want to see the horses. I want to see you put that yoke on. I'll do it right this time. <laughs>